webinar and we had to face um, a, a technical issues, but we figured it out. So um, uh, we are really excited to start this uh, webinar series uh, and uh, to try to be innovative in this uh, difficult moment. Um, thank you so much to our speaker, speaker Richard Fontaine, who has actually devoted a lot of his speaking time recently to the French American Foundation. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you to Megan Carroll, a great friend of the foundation for also participating and trying very hard like for the past five minutes. <laughs> um, Megan will introduce Richard and moderate the discussion. So I'm going to say a few words about Megan before she starts. Uh, Megan is currently at the United Nations where she covers counter-terrorism issues in Asia. She has served across the UN in political affairs, peacekeeping and development. Megan was also appointed as a White House fellow by President Obama, where she was part of the US government's response to the Ebola, Ebola epidemic. She's previously spent four years in Sudan and South Sudan where, with the Carter Center, UN and US government. Earlier in her career, she managed a human rights program at Harvard University and taught English in Japan. She's a council, council on foreign relations term member and a young leader of the French American Foundation. So Megan, Richard, thank you again for being with us today. And Megan, I will let you introduce Richard. Thank you, Emmeline, and thank you to the French American Foundation for bringing us all together during these difficult days. And Richard, thank you for joining us as we kick off this webinar series and discuss a very important and timely topic, how the coronavirus or how the coronavirus pandemic will change geopolitics. Before we get started, I wanted to provide a very brief overview of our time together. Richard will provide some remarks, I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll shift to those who are tuning in. I would ask that you please submit your questions in the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen, indicating your name and possible affiliation. We'll aim to wrap up in about 45 minutes. As Emmeline already said, we ask for your patience with any possible technical glitches because this is a pioneering uh, mission today. Richard Fontaine is the Chief Executive Officer of the Center for a New American Security, CNAS. He served as President of CNAS from 2012 to 2019 and as Senior Advisor and Senior Fellow from 2009 to 2012. Prior to the CNAS, he was Foreign Policy Advisor to Senator John McCain and worked at the State Department, the National Security Council, and on the staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Earlier in his, earlier in his career, he also spent a year teaching in Japan. Mr. Fontaine holds an MA in International Affairs from the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SIFE, and a BA in International Relations from Tulane University. He also attended Oxford University. He's a proud French American Foundation Young Leader 2015. Richard, thanks again for being with us. Over to you. Well, thanks very much. Thanks to everybody who's joined us and Megan to you for uh, moderating uh, this conversation. And, um, and especially to Emily and the French America Foundation, what they are doing uh, under uh, her leadership is really extraordinary. And uh, it's really an honor to be part of uh, what they're doing. Um, it was a great experience to be a French America um, Foundation young leader a few years ago. And it's a real pleasure to still be in touch with folks and to talk about some of the big issues um, that uh, the world is facing, but of course also um, the United States and, and France and, and their special relationship between those two countries that we both uh, have such affection for. Uh, what I thought I would do is just try to make maybe five points um, up front about how all of this strikes me. We're still so clearly in the early days of seeing uh, how the coronavirus pandemic is changing things. Uh, one thing we know uh, which is very obvious, is that it is changing almost everything right now, uh, economics, society, politics, international affairs, everything, uh, in very consequential ways. Although the perturbations and how this all plays out, we got a long way to go to, to determine. But it seems to me that there's maybe five things that we can discern from what's happened so far and, and, and maybe guesses that we can make about where things are going here. Um, when it comes to the effect of coronavirus uh, and this pandemic on geopolitics, uh, more broadly speaking. 
And, and the first is actually uh, kind of an unfortunate one. If, if you think uh, about the kinds of things that should bring the countries of the world together, certainly the major powers, um, it is a threat that is, you know, common to all of them, something external to all of them, you know, I, an asteroid hitting the earth or something, or pandemic disease. No country in the world has an interest uh, in pandemic disease spreading. Every country, every government in the world realizes that if it spreads in one country, it's going to be a threat ultimately to their country as well. And this would suggest that there's greater uh, international cooperation to fight the pandemic uh, than you would have seen on other issues, which are much more competitive. Unfortunately, we haven't seen much of that really at all uh, thus far. So last um, Monday, there was a, uh, an emergency uh, G7 uh, summit uh, meeting that was called at the instigation of President Macron, although the United States is the chair of the G7 this year. It issued a, a, a wonderfully worded statement about how uh, the G7 countries are going to work together and, and cooperate and collaborate. There was not a single specific time-bound commitment about how they would actually do that uh, included in their statement. Um, today, this morning, there was a G20 uh, call there, uh, that, that, uh, that essentially ended similarly. Uh, there was a, a statement pledging cooperation, not a single specific commitment. Um, the UN Security Council is, is, can't even issue a statement because uh, the China and the United States are going back and forth about whether to mention uh, the origin of the pandemic in Wuhan province or not. Um, and, and so what you're seeing, and that, that's at the level of high international diplomacy, but what you see more is countries closing their borders to others, barring the export of medical equipment to others, really tending to themselves. And what it leads to is kind of an every country for itself um, sort of approach to geopolitics right now, which is not maybe what many of us would have predicted immediately when you see this kind of common threat. There just isn't a lot of, of, of working together right now. May change in the future, but so far, no. Second, um, again, it, if you look at US-China relations, which of course is the issue that animates so much of the thinking among foreign policy folks in, in Washington and in the Trump administration, Pandemic disease is the sort of paradigmatic example of the kind of island of cooperation that should be able to take place in this ocean of competition between the United States and China. We're always supposed to be able to carve out climate change, nonproliferation, maybe North Korea, some of these areas where we can cooperate even though we're competing on all kinds of other things, technology, economics, the South China Sea, One Belt, One Road, all these, all this other things. But again, actually, the, the pandemic seems to have accentuated the competition rather than to diminish it. The, competition, the, the pandemic, certainly in China's approach to it, um, and to some degree to the United States' approach to it, uh, has become just a new, a new vector for this competition. And so you see uh, China you know, spreading these stories about the Wuhan virus, May, or the, the virus may have not actually started in Wuhan, but started in the United States. You see the Americans insisting on calling it, you know, the Wuhan virus or the China virus. Uh, China trying to sort of win friends and influence people with its provision of, of, um, of medical assistance to, to, to countries. The Jack Ma, the, the, the richest man in China, uh, has been conspicuous in recent days in showing that uh, his foundation has donated medical uh, assistance to every single uh, one of the 54 uh, countries in Africa, for example. So this has just kind of accentuated those competitive dynamics uh, so far. Um, the third point here, uh, which I, I find interesting, is that uh, it shows still the primacy of governments in this geopolitical world that we live in. And so there's often discussions about, well, are we moving toward a world where, you know, the government of nation states is not the primary actor, it's multinational corporations, it's networks of private sector individuals and civil society, it's uh, super empowered individuals, it's whatever you might think it, it is, but it, it's pretty striking that it's only governments so far that are able to uh, marshal the kind of um, health responses that seem to be necessary, including on the, the restrictive side and making people stay home and, and things like that. Um, everyone is calling, of course, for the US government to you know, use the Defense um, Production Act or, or you know, sort of demand of the private sector uh, that they produce things that would be necessary. And then, of course, it's only the central banks and the governments that are able to engage in fiscal policy 
um, that become the, the, the economic stimulants of last resort uh, when you know, our economy is on the verge of kind of shutting down. So it, it shows you just how central governments remain uh, in the world of, of geopolicy we live in today. Um, the, the fourth point that I, I would make is um, one that certainly is, I guess, maybe near and dear to my heart, um, having watched American foreign policy over the last couple of decades, which is we, we are constantly in danger of overreacting, um, not in the acute phase like we are now, but longer term, where we Americans have a tendency sometimes to believe that everything we've been focusing on was total waste of time, uh, that we've taken a holiday from history and that the entire focus should be on something else. And the most obvious example of this was after 9-11, where terrorism was clearly a major, major threat, maybe the biggest threat to the United States, but of course it was not the only threat to the United States and not the only issue, but the amount of resources, time, attention that went into counterterrorism at the expense of other things um, was enormous. Suddenly we were in a, a global war on terror and we had a global counterinsurgency campaign and things like that. Then a couple of years ago, everyone in Washington sort of woke up and said, oh my God, we've been fighting wars in the Middle East. We've overblown the threat of terrorism. It's all about great power competition. It's all about China and Russia. We got to get out of the Middle East. We got to get out of Afghanistan. We got to get out of this counterterrorism stuff to the degree possible so we can focus on China and Russia. And now you're seeing some of that kind of go out the window and people say, Russia, well, you know, this is a, you know, we, we, we've been sleepwalking through the biggest threat, which is about pandemic disease. The point here is that when we get out of this acute phase, China still be around, Russia will still be around terrorism, global warming, pick your issue. Uh, the United States and its allies remain, you know, uh, countries with global interests and we'll have to do multiple things at the same time. And so we have to beware that we don't lurch too much uh, from one thing to the other uh, in ways that would be detrimental. And then, the, and then the last point that I'll just make by this kind of way of, of, of opening here gets back to this, the, the transatlantic relationship and the French-American uh, relationship. And, and, you know, it was President Macron who, uh, who insisted on holding this, this G7 emergency summit, which I thought was uh, a very good move um, before. It's often, um, you know, people often dismiss the G7, the G20, these things as talk shops that don't actually accomplish anything. That's really not the case. There's been times in the past where they have been extremely effective. For example, after 9-11, specific commitments on uh, counterterrorism issues or homeland security issues, um, you know, the, the launching PEPFAR, the Global AIDS Alliance, or the G20 after the global financial crisis, agreeing on a $4 trillion stimulus. And, uh, and, and some monetary policy coordination and things like that. Um, but, but, you know, so there, there's a strong uh, reason for the United States and, and countries uh, like France to work together uh, on this. But at the end of the day, a lot of it just won't happen um, unless it's the United States setting the agenda on these kinds of things. There's a limit to what any president, even one as now visionary, I think, as, as Emmanuel Macron can carry off um, on their own. And so the thing that I'll be waiting for uh, as every country, uh, including the United States, starts to get toward more of a steady state um, and moves toward just take care of our own. This is the emergency phase to uh, something uh, broader is do we develop a more shared sense of responsibility when it comes to this and can the U.S. and and its European partners in particular uh, work together in a way that would be not competitive but actually collaborative uh, and that to me just it, it actually remains a, a question mark I think there's some some reason for optimism but we're not there yet and part of the reason is because countries including our own are, are so obviously reeling under um, the pressure of what's going on. So maybe by way of uh, you know uh, introductory remarks, I can put that on the table. And if there's any uh, questions or comments or anything else, I would be happy to address any of them. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'm, I'll just start with some questions, and then I'm going to wait for some of the questions to come in from our uh, attendees. You mentioned that every government is now pursuing an emo emergency approach to the virus, like quarantines, travel bans, stimulus packages. The missing piece, as you noted, seems to be meaningful international cooperation. Earlier this month, European leaders, particularly President Macron, 
work to convince President Trump to organize a teleconference of G7 leaders on coronavirus coordination. As President Macron stated, we are at war with the global pandemic. For all the rhetoric that you mentioned about a shared global threat, to a large extent, the practice so far is every country for itself. What should the U.S. and France be doing? Well, I think the, the, the G7 um, in particular uh, was a missed opportunity. The G20 is a lot harder uh, because you have China and Russia in the room. The, the level of distrust is far higher and things like that. The G7, though, is uh, could be a particularly useful vehicle for organizing things. Um, and in that sense, I, I think that's I think President Macron was right that that's the logical vehicle uh, to start with. And so, uh, you know, as the G7 stands now, there was the leaders meeting last week. There was a meeting of foreign ministers yesterday. Um, they were unable to issue a statement, um, supposedly, reportedly, because the United States insisted on referring to it as the China virus or the Wuhan virus and couldn't get the rest to agree, which is a, a pretty terrible reason for the G7 not to act because, uh, because we're insisting over the use of a particular adjective. Um, uh, and, and so I think there's plenty of opportunities for American officials or anybody else who wants you to get in their digs about China's outrageous behavior, but we need to get beyond that and use the G7 among other uh, mechanisms to be able to do some things bilaterally, I mean, uh, multilaterally. So what are those kinds of things? Well, I mean, the World Health Organization right now uh, is um, hitting up celebrities and, and other individuals to try to fill the gap to, to fund their emergency appeal. Um, that's the kind of thing that the G7 countries could fund with the stroke of a pen. Um, they're looking for $675 million. They received about 125, $150 million, something like that. Um, so they should fill the gap. Uh, the, 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 the countries could look at not just the development of a vaccine, which is getting so much attention, but once there is a vaccine or either even therapeutics that can be used, how do you actually manufacture those at scale and distribute those, especially in countries that don't have uh, a lot of health capacity? That's the kind of thing that G7 uh, could come around. And, you know, there's a bunch of other things that they could be doing, um, but, but, the, but that's a couple of ideas for starters. That's great. And we saw that happen with Ebola and some of the other ep epidemics and pandemics. Exactly. So there's, there, there's seven coming together in a more meaningful way. Right. So th there's not a playbook for something uh, on this scale, but there is a, a playbook for multilateral action uh, to try right. to at least mitigate the worst effects of this. Um, but it would take a bit of a, a shift in, in uh, attitude, not just by the United States, but by most of the countries that say, hey, look, you know, last thing in the world we want to do at this moment is, you know, help somebody else when we have such need at home. It does take a broader, uh, you know, notion. I mean, some of the areas of the world that I, you know, w once this, this virus gets going in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, we could have, you know, another major problem on our hands. And as hermetically sealed as everyone would like to think we are, it's clearly not the case. And so... Uh, you know, even if you only care about your yourself and your family and your own country, um, then you have reason to care about what will happen um, as this breaks out. You know, if New York doesn't have enough ventilators, I can guarantee you Bangladesh is not going to have enough. Absolutely. I, I cover Southeast Asia for work and also with Afghanistan. And there's, as you know, basically zero health infrastructure in a lot of these countries. And it's, it's terrifying. Um, I'll move to the next question. Uh, you talked about 9-11. And as you, as you rightly stated, some have argued that COVID-19 will be the biggest game changer for U.S. foreign policy and national security since 9-11, as, as it is the first crisis since 9-11 that will impact the daily life of every American. Once we get through this, what do you think will be some of the key lessons we can learn moving forward? Um, well, one key lesson is that uh, we should pay attention to pandemic disease. Uh, I can I can tell you, and I'm as guilty as anybody about this, um, uh, that you know, in retrospect, there are warning signs that that the the national security um, policymaking community, both in Washington and in other countries, should have been paying more attention to this threat than others. It's not just coronavirus, but we've been through in previous years Ebola, uh, N1, H1N1. Zika, dengue fever. I mean, you know, every couple of years we've seen uh, something. Most of them have been able successfully to be more or less nipped in the bud. Um, 
compared to what we're seeing now. Uh, but when you compare the effect on the daily lives of citizens of what we're going through now, even compared to 9-11, I mean, I, I, I was in Washington in 9-11 and was in my apartment building next to the Pentagon when the plane hit the Pentagon. It was, it was a very rattling event, but I was in grad school and we all went to school the next day. Uh, you know, it was, it did not have this profound, as profound a change in daily life as this does now. So I think one of the very first lessons is, you know, what are the other, uh, what are the other black swans, so to speak, or what are the other, uh, uh, you know, kinds of things uh, that could really change daily life? The, the, the looming one that gets attention but not action is, is global warming. And here it's not, it's just not clear to me whether um, a, an increased focus on pandemic disease going forward is going to make people more conscious of global warming's potential effects because they say, hey, look, if, if pandemic disease could change our daily lives, and certainly global warming could do so in a way that is as profound and we need to deal with it, or if it will alternatively suck the time and attention and resources from global warming and any other sort of global threat that you might be able to think about and put it all toward the pandemic stuff. And, and that's where I get back to this. Like, let's pay attention, but let's not lurch so far that we pretend like there are another, not other issues out there. Uh, th thank you. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, we talked about Europe, and I just wanted to, to go back to that. Uh, President Trump did not notify his European counterparts that he was going to shut the U.S. border before he did. Of course, there's a public health rationale for that. But is this kind of diplomatic disregard the new normal? Uh, yeah, so far. I mean, and, and you know, uh, of course, I point out that it's not just um, the United States that's active this way. I mean, European countries have closed their borders to others. Maybe they gave each other a heads up, but they did it nevertheless. And it was not clear to me at all that if their neighbors objected that that was going to mean anything. You know, our, our friends in Germany, the, the, the liberal state in the middle of Europe that is so committed to the Schengen zone and everything else, um, you know, barred the export of certain health products, even to other EU countries, which, you know, an EU lawyer on the phone may be able to tell me whether that's legal, but they did it one way or the other because they, I mean, basically it was Germany first. So all of a sudden you saw Germany first, America first, Britain first, you know, um, and, and, you know, th that is the normal for now. I don't think that will be the normal forever, but I think it will be the normal for a while, um, simply because, you know, the, the number one priority of every national leader right now is to arrest the virus spreading in their own country because of the health and economic effects that this is having. And that puts huge pressure to make decisions on the spot uh, without much regard to your, your friends and allies. Uh, it's not ideal. Um, and and I, I like to think that we can do you know, more on the collaborative side, as I said, but I think that is where we are for right now. You mentioned that nations initially refusing to offer masks and shutting down borders. Does this create more or less unity, in your opinion, within the EU? And is this a return of the nation state? Well, as I was saying before, I think the nation state never went away, um, despite all of the predictions for its withering. Uh, and if anything, it's coming back with further force uh, because you know, one of the things, one of the lessons of the last few years, one of the lessons from elections in the United States and, and all across Europe and, and in Asia as well, is that there are a lot of people who define their moral community as the nation, not as their town, not as their continent, not as some broader cosmopolitan global community, but rather their nation. And they would like to treat their nation uh, with uh, rules and favoritism different than they are willing to, to do with others. And so I think the nation state was already back. I think this will make it even more so. Um, I mean, rare is the European uh, leader right now that seems to be trying to speak for Europe, uh, right? As opposed to for the French, for the Germans, for the British, for the Americans, for the, you know, whatever. Um, uh, and, and so I think this is gonna deepen that there's another factor here, which is at least theoretically possible. And you've seen little bits and pieces of that. And I, I just don't know how this will play out, but, but certainly this provides ammunition in Europe for this kind of right wing nativist, anti-immigrant, uh, you know, kind of neo-isolationist sort of paradigm. Like, you know, this is what you get from kind of throwing the borders open to people and diseases and goods and, and all these other things you know, we have to be hungry for the Hungarians. We have to be, you know, and, and uh, 
how much fuel that will give to that, I, I, it's hard to say. We're, it's, we're so new into that. And, you know, we'll see when elections start to roll around whether people effectively campaign on that kind of message. But I certainly think that gives ammunition to that narrative. Thank you. I have lots more questions, but given the time, I, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in from our um, our friends online. So I'm going to start. I'm going to shift to some of the questions. We have one from Byron Callen. He asks, "Can you address state fragility in 2020, 2021? Besides COVID-19, there's been a collapse in oil prices, and this has been adding multiple stresses to some states and regimes. Is this a concern? If so." Where is the greatest risk and what could be done now to address these risks? Venezuela, Venezuela, Venezuela. I mean, the, 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 the price spat between Saudi Arabia and Russia was particularly ill-timed, shall we say. Um, and then this, um, the, this Saudi approach of, we're gonna flood the market with oil in order to show the Russians that if they don't agree with us on restrictions, then it will be terrible for them. And then ultimately we will, uh, you know, agree with them on something and then the price will shoot back up to be even higher than it was originally. I mean, th this is bad for all kinds of reasons. Um, I, I, I'm particularly worried about Venezuela though, which, you know, the Saudi Arabias, the, you know, the Gulf states, the, the Russians, you know, others, they can get by for a while on very low oil prices. Venezuela has, essentially nothing but oil. Its economy was already in free fall. Their health infrastructure was already crumbling. Um, they're under sanctions. They're terribly mismanaged economically and politically. Um, and th this could really be the perfect storm uh, for that country of a virus uh, hitting them with abandon just at the moment where the one thing that they sell is selling for a price lower than the price required, to, the cost required to get it out of the ground. It's, 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 it's pretty bleak. Thanks. Our next question is from Isaac. He asks, how might the international response have been different if it had happened pre-Brexit pre and pre-Trump? Mm, well, that, th there will probably be um, books written about, you know, counterfactual books written for decades uh, about that. That's, that's a great question, a uh, great speculative question, right? Because uh, we don't know. Um, Brexit, I, uh, I, I don't know how different it would have been, um, you know, pre-Brexit. So if you imagine that, you know, David Cameron was the prime minister now uh, of, of the United Kingdom and, you know, rather than having voted to come out and abide by the same uh, sort of uh, commitments for the duration of 2020, they had not voted and they were still abiding by those commitments. I don't know, it's, it's hard to see how different that would have been. I'm sure there would have been some. Um, I do think that the, you know, had Hillary Clinton or, I don't know, Jeb Bush or somebody been president of the United States, I do think there would have been uh, uh, likely a pretty significant uh, difference in approach uh, in a couple of ways. One is certainly on this international front that, you know, if you look at the Obama administration, what it did with the G20 uh, and international coordination after the global financial crisis, the Bush administration, what it did after 9-11, or in some of these other issues, you know, PEPFAR and the AIDS pandemic and stuff like that um, internationally. Uh, if you look at certainly the Clinton administration, I mean, there was much more of an, in, or even in the George H.W. Bush administration, all the way back with Iraq, which was a very different kind of thing. But the, the instinct was always, you know, get on the phone, call up your friends and allies, and let's like rally the troops. And if we don't rally the troops as America, God bless everybody else, but they're not going to be self-organizing. They're just not going to do it on their own. Um, and, and so we have to set the agenda and try to bring folks along and, and things like that. And I just have so far don't see that. Uh, in the current administration. So that's on the international side. And then, you know, certainly in, in the president himself, you've got a, a, a personality wholly unique in terms of communication and decision making and things like that uh, and process and, and things. How that all would have netted out in terms of a difference uh, on the ground is hard to say, but I think there would have been some difference. I can pretty much guarantee that. Our next question is from Emmanuel Catan at Columbia University. Emmanuel asks, you mentioned WHO. How would you rate its role in taking a leadership role in the crisis? How could it be reinforced? I think the WHO has gotten uh, better. I was worried um, at the beginning of this crisis um, 
that there it, it, it was uh, too um, deferential to China's reporting and characterizations of the virus and its effects, um, while it was still really a, mostly a Chinese phenomenon. Um, but since then, they've they've sort of sounded the alarm more and things like that. The thing that I the, the area where I think the WHO can play the greatest role, and this is actually gets back to this issue of the health infrastructure in countries that are poor or just lack meaningful uh, infrastructure. I mean, it shows in New York where a lot of you are are calling from. I mean, we don't have the infrastructure quite obviously, even in the you know our. I shouldn't say this on a French America, the greatest city in the world other than Paris. I don't know, how, how, what would we call New York? One of the greatest cities in the world, we don't have the infrastructure necessary to deal with this. Um, the WHO can play a really meaningful role. And so the, the key thing is this emergency response fund that they've, that they've put together. And, and the idea that, that we, as of yesterday, as a government have passed a $2 trillion package and the WHO is, is still gonna be out shaking the tin cup trying to find money for their $670 million emergency response fund to me is, is just crazy. I mean, this should be a no brainer um, to, to, to fund that um, and more. And then the other thing the WHO can do is, um, you know, there are these other organizations like Gavi, the global block, global vaccine Alliance and things like that, um, that, that can link with WHO and, 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 uh, and do things on their own in order to get, uh, therapeutics and, and vaccines out there once those are available, again, to countries where either production or distribution networks are not uh, as strong as they would need to be. Thanks. Our next question is from Alice Salavandion. Alice, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. From a French point of view, Donald Trump's reaction to the COVID crisis is hard to understand. Do you think there are underlying factors to the decision to favor the economy rather than public health in a major national lockdown, besides concerns about the 2020 presidential election? Thank you. Yeah, I do. Um, and, and, you know, this obviously gets into some extremely sensitive territory because, um, you know, the, so Governor Cuomo, for example, is taking a very different stand. And as he said repeatedly in the last couple of days, you know, if all the steps that we're taking save, you know, even one life, then they're worth it. That is not typically the way that countries make public policy is not to say that if one life is worth it, we will expend any amount of resources or absorb any amount of economic costs. We, public policy in, often involves trade-offs between, uh, you know, lives and livelihoods um, all the time, particularly when you're talking about some domestic policy. And so, you know, part of this turns on a prediction of, um, you know, what this really is that we're talking about. You know, if, um, if you believe that ultimately 80% of the population is going to get this over a, a, you know, a, a time span of 18 months, um, and you know, the different, so deaths would be higher if it happened all at once, but the economic uh, situation would bounce back sooner. There is at least an argument to be had to try to do something like that, um, simply because there's gonna be terrible health effects from the 3 million people that just filed for unemployment in the last couple of days, not to mention all of the other bad effects that are gonna go on from having people thrown out of work and the anxiety and, and, and all of the, the social disruption that goes along with that. So what we're, I think with the government, and, and I, I have no qualifications to make these kinds of judgments, so I can't tell you what I would necessarily do or think. I mean, this is out of my realm of, of, of expertise um, by far, but um, I think what's on the table is, is multiple bad decisions, multiple bad outcomes, and we're trying to identify and decide what the least bad outcome is, weighing both the, the, the threat to human life, which is horrible, and the threat to, to economics. I, I see sometimes this being characterized as, you know, people want people to die so they can add a few points to the Dow Jones or something like that. And, and I mean, to me, that's not really what's at issue here. It's not nothing to say that our economy would be in depression for 18 months with millions of people, you know, if we got to 30% unemployment or something like that. Um, so how you weigh one against the other is very difficult and that also, turns on what your, your, your scenarios are, what you think the trade-offs actually are. How many lives are you gonna actually try to trade off for how much livelihood and things like that. It's a really difficult situation. 
Um, but that's my more benign interpretation of where the president's head is. But, you know, it could also be that he just wants the economy to go back up because it would help with the election. I, I, I haven't talked to him, so I don't know. We have, yeah, I haven't, <laughs> th 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 thanks Richard. Our next question came in from Emerson. He says, the crisis has exposed our extreme reliance on China for the production of goods, especially some with national security implications such as, such as masks. Two questions, I'll ask them one at a time. Will it be the responsibility of the American government to force companies that produce strategically important goods to relocate production back to the United States? And, go ahead. Well, so on that, um, the answer should be no, and I'll tell you why. There's a lot of, I think, actually confusion coming along about this. The, the supply chain fragility is a real problem, as we see when masks are made in China or iPhones are, are made in China and people can't go to work and suddenly you can't get a new iPhone or whatever, whatever your supply chain is. But that's not the case because it's China. That's the case because the supply chains have a centralized production node. If that centralized production mode was in Manhattan, we would have the same effective problem if people couldn't go to work. So the issue, so there's two separate issues. One is reliance on China. And there, if you're talking about high tech goods that can be compromised or things like that, um, I think there's actually a case to, to move that stuff out of China on its own merits, wholly apart from disease and these other things. But what we're talking about here when it's talking about production of mass or something are, what happens when your supplier goes dark for whatever reason? And that's not just something that could happen in China, that could happen anywhere. And so the answer to that is not to move the factory in China to you know, Nebraska and hope that Nebraskans don't get sick. It's to have more than one source of supply, to actually diversify supply chains even and reduce the risk associated with supply chain fragility, even if that ends up increasing the cost because you're not getting the economies of scale that you'll otherwise get. And I think that's gonna be the really searching set of decisions that companies make once the smoke clears from all this. The second part you've addressed a bit already was what will be the implications of this for the just-in-time JIT supply chain? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, th there's, um, this is a guess. I think that there will be more emphasis on the diversification of su supply chain and the production side as opposed to holding huge inventories, right? Like, so Tim Cook at Apple famously says, you know, inventory is evil, right? You know, it's all gotta be just in time because inventory that sits on your shelves is not being sold, it's a cost of the company and things like that. One way to deal with that would be for companies to always have, you know, 10 million masks in a warehouse ready to go in case they ever wanna sell them. Another would be to have multiple places where masks can be produced in case you need to step up production. My guess is that it's the latter, but you know, you're talking to a foreign policy guy, so like that's just a guess. There's probably other people on the phone that have a much better uh, and more informed view than I do on that. Our next question comes from Rachel. She says, what is your view on how this might impact the elections, both Democratic primary and also the general? Is it too soon to tell if this is something that will be detrimental or advantageous for Trump? It's totally too soon to tell. Um, I mean, think about the fact that was it three weeks ago that we were all convinced Bernie Sanders was going to be the nominee? And now everybody says, oh, it was clear it's going to be Biden all along. You know, Bernie never had a real shot. I mean, you know, last time it looked as about 7 p.m. on election night that Hillary Clinton was going to be the next president of the United States. And then that went out the window. I mean, if, if you look historically, um, Americans tend to reelect their presidents about 70 percent of the time. And they do so. Uh, when they don't, that 30% of the time tends to be either when the economy's in recession or there's a major foreign policy crisis. Well, Trump's got both of those right now. So if the election was today, historically speaking, he would have a real problem on his hand convincing people, one, that this economy that he's essentially campaigned on is, is you should keep him going. And then two, um, you know, that, that he's handling this foreign policy crisis. But there's two big caveats. One, uh, Trump's approval ratings have gone up, not down. Uh, as this crisis has gone on. There's always something associated with presidential action that seems to, whether it ends up being effective or not. I mean, LBJ during the, during the Vietnam War, when he increased bombing in Vietnam, his approval rating went up. When he decreased bombing, his approval rating ran up. As long as he was announcing he was doing something, people thought, okay, the president's acting and there was a certain rally around him kind of effect. 
Um, so who knows how that's going to end up netting out in terms of, you know, whether Trump gets credit for dealing with the crisis well, or if he's diminished by the sense that he wasn't able to deal with the crisis, if this becomes kind of Jimmy Carter with the Iran hostages or something like that. Now that, but the, but the big issue is it's March. We don't know what the hell is going to happen this summer, this fall. I can paint you two totally different pictures. One where, you know, we get through this, the economy bounces back, and Donald Trump says, I vanquished impeachment, I vanquished the deepest recession in American history, and I vanquished the coronavirus, you know, vote for me, you know, because that guy Biden, or, but I can imagine another scenario where, you know, the economy hasn't close to bouncing back and people, you know, maybe the acute phase, but we're getting into round two of the coronavirus and, and the president looks like he's flailing and, and, you know, and all this other stuff in which it's a huge albatross. So we, I, if anybody knows, please send me a direct message telling me who's going to win the presidential election and by how much, because I would love to know, but I'm not one of those who does. Next, next question is very interesting. It comes from Gregory Yijikert. With the current shift to remote work, there has been an increased concern in cybersecurity and privacy and communications. Presently, there is legis legislation introduced in the U.S. Senate, earn it, that would force service providers to abandon end-to-end -end encryption. Can you share your thoughts on the potential implications of such a legislation being passed? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, I, I don't think there's going to be, um, that they're going to legislate away end -to end encryption. Um, I mean, this has been floating around for a few years now. I mean, back when James Comey was the head of the FBI, he would hold, you know, the, the cell phone in the air and, and, and actually the, the district attorney in New York, same thing, and say, you know, we can't get through this because of Apple's and, and encryption, all of which started to come on board after the Snowden revelations. So there's been talk about forcing companies not to include end-to-end -end encryption or to have a backdoor available to government um, for surveillance purposes. Um, it, at least when it comes to crime fighting, if not for national security purposes, none of that's ever gotten off the ground. And, um, and, and I, I wouldn't bet on that. It, and if anything, you know, the degree to which people, um, rely more for what they would require as protected communications, because they're all working from home. I think the imperative to have secure communications as opposed to ones that have, um, a backdoor or, or, you know, or encryption keys that are shared with the government or anybody else. I think that imperative actually goes up. I mean, you know, the big worry in the last, you know, couple, week or so has been the compromise of data that's being transmitted from companies and, and research institutions to the CDC, for example, or to HHS, not, you know, do we have somebody who committed a crime, the evidence is on their phone and we need to crack it to get it. So, um, I don't think that legislation is likely. Our last question comes from Isaac. What does this crisis mean for the future of China's global leadership aspirations? Um, I don't think that China ultimately gonna, is going to be as successful in this narrative painting that they're trying to work on right now. So what China would like is people to forget that this originated in China and that the Chinese authorities uh, covered up the outbreak in Wuhan, punished some of the whistlebroke, uh, whistleblowers, and, and were uh, essentially dishonest about the number of cases and the pace of this. So they want people to forget that. And part of that is to spread this disinformation, as even the spokesman for the foreign ministry has done, um, that maybe this was brought to Wuhan by American uh, army officers who were visiting, or maybe this was cooked up somewhere in the United States or something like that. So they want to kind of blur that, that recollection of history. Um, then they want to distinguish their own response uh, where they have you know, flattened the curve, uh, much uh, unlike we have been able to do so far, and contrast that response with, look, here's what a decisive authoritarian, in control government like ours can do to eradicate this problem in great contrast to you know, the fractious, um, slow uh, democracies that don't seem to be able to get their act together. Uh, so that's part two. So one is, is distort the history. Two is, is contrast their own system with that of, of particularly the American democracy, um, but others as well. 
and say that there is a superior model and respond to these kinds of things. And then the third is to say the United States is not leading in the world and can't help you while China can. And, and that's why you see very conspicuously, you know, plane loads of medical equipment landing in Italy all of a sudden and landing in Spain all of a sudden and going to African countries and, and things like that. And, and, you know, almost baiting the, the Americans to say, you know, well, how much has America sent your way? And actually it's the United States is going around asking other countries to send medical equipment to us. Now, again, history is important here. I mean, China, one of the reasons why there's, there was a run on masks made in China was because China built up, bought up its entire national supply and, and wouldn't allow the export to any country, including countries that had coronavirus cases. Once the coronavirus uh, peaked and passed, then suddenly they were in the business of, of aiding other countries. They were not aiding other countries when they were in our situation. But these are, mm -hmm. these are, these are, you know, kind of uh, nuances, right? So uh, that is what China would like. They would like to use this as a pivot to show that American leadership in the world is on the decline and that there's on the ascendance. I actually don't think they're going to be as, as successful as they may hope on this, in part because people around the entire world are following this pretty damn closely. Um, and I mean, this is not a niche issue here. Uh, this impacts their livelihoods. Every country's leader who gets some aid from China is going to go out and thank the Chinese and praise them in a statement and say, yes, yes, and give us more. But how much that actually converts into looking to Beijing as the global leader of European countries, African countries, um, I I'm skeptical that they're going to be able to convert. But that said, who knows? Uh, they're certainly betting on that, and uh, and you know, part of the, the part of this will turn on what the United States is doing to provide an alternative to that leadership. And right now, I'm afraid we're not really much in the game. I hope we will we will get in the game uh, here in the future because I'd rather have a, a world looking to the United States for leadership than to China. It's a nice note to end on, Richard. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for joining us and, and thank you for everyone who joined us online. Great, great questions. Um, we've run out of time. I hope everyone stays safe and well during this very difficult time. And uh, Richard, thanks again. Oh, thanks. Take Sarah. care, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Stay well. All right, everyone. Um, I'm just filling in for Emmeline. She might be having some internet problems right now, but um, uh, from the FAF staff, thank you so much for coming. Um, we just want to announce that um, our next webinar will be on Wednesday, April 1st on the uh, impact of fake news uh, on coronavirus um, and how those two things are playing out right now with um, a member of our Transatlantic Forum, Sheen LaBay, who is a senior editor at uh, NewsGuard Technologies. Um, so again, thank you, Richard and Megan, this was great. Um, and I look forward to seeing everyone next week.